Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And boy, do we have a great episode for you today. We have one of uh, a man that I listen to on the radio quite a bit. It's a book written about him, Myron Cope. Uh, the author of the book, it just came out recently, is Dan Joseph. Dan, welcome to the Pig Pen. Thank you, Darren. I'm glad to be here. And But I'm the, I'm the, I'm the co-author. I, the, I was a uh, helped immensely in this book by Myron's daughter, Elizabeth Cope, who wrote some of the chapters and, of course, gave me access to all of Myron's papers and tapes, without which the book, you know, would not be possible. Yeah, and we're going to talk a lot about her because, uh, you know, finishing up the, the book, I got a chance to read the book, and I appreciate you sending a copy on. And uh, some of the things that she said, especially the ending, uh, I mean, I had some tears in my eyes. I had some laughter in my heart and uh, some fond memories of, of Myron Cope, who I, I listened to. So let's start off, with Dan, let's uh, tell the title of your book and where folks can get it. Uh, well, the book here, if I may hold it up for a second. Yeah, absolutely, is, please. The book is uh, Behind the Yoy, and um, it is uh, available. It was published by University of Nebraska Press. And just came out at the beginning of September. It is at uh, it's available through directly from the press. You can buy it on Amazon, either on Kindle or a hardback. It's in in Pittsburgh. It's in all the Barnes and Noble stores we've checked, and it's in the Steelers uh, Pro Shop. Uh, their 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 various locations and and other bookstores in the area. Well. That so certainly gives you a lot of avenues to buy it. And for folks that are out of the, the Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania area, is it available online too, besides the Nebraska Press? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. It, it's available on Amazon or or directly from the publisher. Okay. Awesome. All right. Now, of course, many people that uh, have been around the Steelers or listen to the Steelers for more than 20 years or so definitely know the name of, of Myron Cope. Uh, I, I was fortunate to live in Western Pennsylvania and be a Steelers fan and uh, got to enjoy many of his uh, his, his great, uh, he, he was sort of a homer, but he was our homer uh, for, for being a Steelers fan. I'm sure folks of uh, other uh, persuasions in the NFL probably didn't really care for him, but he, he was sort of that that flavor of sauce that uh, might not taste good your first drink, but uh Hey, it's pretty pretty cool, and you can't can't get enough of it once it's going. So, very lovable figure. Yeah, that, that's a good way of describing him because a lot of people uh, had trouble getting used to his voice. It, it took a certain amount of uh, adjustment because this was unlike any voice you heard on the radio. Um, it was scratchy, it was screechy, it was high pitched, and, and you know there was no broadcasting training in this man's background. He just was plopped in front of a microphone one day and began talking began shouting uh and it worked because he was so creative and funny and insightful you know even though he didn't sound like i mean he I mean, at first glance he sounded like who's this raving lunatic you know he actually was saying some very insightful stuff in his commentaries during during steeler games and in, on his talk show uh there was a very smart man behind this sort of a uh, crazy image that he had yeah, m most definitely. And and that's sort of how I knew him. I was born in the mid 60s. So about the time when I was able to start remembering things, that's about when the Immaculate Reception happened. And, you know, it was Steelers magic from there. So I remember Myron from a young age, sort of young in his uh, being a Steelers, a voice of the Steelers. He's only, I think, three or four years into it by that point, which yeah. uh, he, he basically covered the entire Chuck Knoll era, except for maybe the first two years all of the Bill Cow era and even part of the Mike Tomlin era of football. So that's, I mean, that's quite a, a span of like 30, 36 years. Is that what he was? 35 years? It, it was, it was 35 years in the Steeler booth. And and then, you know, he was doing uh commentaries for a couple of years before he didn't quite make it into the Mike Tomlin area era. He, uh, he retired a little bit before that, but okay. uh, yeah, it was a very long, impressive run. I think, number two it's either, either number one or two among nfl uh broadcasters um he was and he was popular you know all, all the way to the end he, even in his later years when his voice got really really scratchy and it's hard to kind of understand him he remained very very popular he was so unique and he's so beloved and, and still to the end just a, a funny guy a, a fun to listen to yeah, absolutely. And I was kind of surprised. I mean, I 
if I had to guess uh, before I read your book and had the facts in front of me, somebody said, hey, when was the last time you heard Myron Cope do a Steelers game? I said, oh, maybe five, six years ago. I mean, he he's just so ingrained in the aura of a Steelers fan. It doesn't seem like that long ago. When you're telling me, you know, 2004, 2005 was this last year. That's the beginning of Ben Roethlisberger as a quarterback. Uh -huh. And I'm like, well, I, I was taken back by that a little bit. How, how bad my memory is. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he, uh, yeah, he made it to the edge of the kind of the new Steelers Super Bowl area era when when they had Roethlisberger and Paul Amalu and James Harrison and Heinz Ward, and I think maybe that kind of extended his memory, you know, but his his public memory a little bit. Uh, people do to some extent asso associate him with those players, um, and they still, you know, he's still a presence at, at Steeler games and at the Steelers Stadium, uh, the former Heinz Field. Uh, his his picture is in a lot of places there, and they often show him waving the terrible towel up on the jumbotron. I was at the Steeler home opener this year, and I I saw him uh, up on the scoreboard. And Craig Wolfley, the current announcer, will occasionally slip into a Myron imitation or refer to him. So his memory is still very much with the team and in the public uh, mind of you know of Pittsburgh. Yeah, well, I, I'm one of those that uh, totally drinks the Kool-Aid that the Steelers are selling. And I'm listening to Steelers Nation radio quite often daily. And Craig Wolfley and Max Starks have a, a great program on every morning. And they, they too, often talk about Myron. Uh, usually once a week, there's a, a good Myron story. And uh, you know, especially mm -hmm. when, when Tunch Oaken used to be Wolfley's partner in that show before he, he, he uh, passed, uh, you know, they always had a good Myron story going on. Had some chuckles. Yeah, well, and, well you know, I talked memories. to Craig Wolfley for the book. And he told me that Myron was a little bit of an inspiration for him because, as he put it, Myron paved the way for lesser trained, lesser schooled announcers, uh, guys who weren't out of central broadcasting school. Like, yeah, now, now, Bill Hillgrove is a uh, he's a legend in his own right. He, but he's more what you expect an, an announcer to sound like. He has these rounded tones. He has lots of energy. He speaks the English language perfectly. Uh, and Myron was the opposite of all that, but but uh, completely effective in his own way. And Craig Wolfley kind of I think identified with that because he has you know he does, has more of a gruff type of voice, and uh, you know it, it just, but he has a similar sense of humor to Myron. Yeah, and he has his uh, little. Uh words that he makes up and or uses them out of context but they seem perfectly okay just by, by the, the entity it's say, saying them. yeah it's just like myron did but well let's yeah. before we get too much more into myron let's let's get a little bit into you why don't you give us sort of the 50 cent tour of uh you know what brought you into writing a, about a, a football legend and you know how you got connected with the the cope family and writing a book about myron all right well i grew up in pittsburgh um I was old enough to be around for the last two Super Bowls. I remember, you know, watching those, the, the two in the, at the end of the 70s. Um, and I grew up in Mount Lebanon. I, I When I was a kid, I kind of thought I would be a sports writer. I would open the Pittsburgh Press in the, in the evening. It was an afternoon paper. So I'd get it and spread it out on the floor and read the sports section. And, and my writing influences are actually former press sports writers like Bob Smizek and Phil Music. Um, and, but it just, you know, life didn't work out that way. I uh, I went to Indiana University in uh, in Bloomington, Indiana. And um, I, I kind of went on a, like a, a different path. I thought I would go into magazines. Then I, I wound up working for Voice of America in DC and I'm an editor there. And I edit scripts from all over the world, you know, news events all, all over the world. Um, I remained a Steeler fan and a, and a Pirate fan also all these years. And, and um, that's a tough thing to do lately, too. Uh, <laughs> I can attest to that. It. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am. One of, I'm one of the youngest people alive, I think, who attended a Pirates World Series game. I went to uh, game four hmm. of the 79 World Series. Um, but I, just, you know, I, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, it's been 45 years. But um, I never became a sports writer, but I always had this great interest in sports, retained it, I mean. And I'd written a couple of baseball books 
And then through a friend of a friend, uh, I uh, made contact with uh, Elizabeth Cope. And she had all this stuff that Myron had collected over the years and, and left. And uh, she wanted to do something with it. She wasn't sure what. Uh, but we wound up talking and it turned into two projects, one being the book and then the tapes we've used to create the Myron Cope channel on YouTube, uh, where we uh -huh. have assorted videos, you know, from from Steeler games and the talk show and commentaries. And that that's gotten uh, a good reception. And, um, you know, you can look that up when you have a chance. The official Myron so is that, Cope is that what it's called? Is that the Myron Cope channel? On YouTube? The, the official Myron okay. Cope channel. OK, on YouTube. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll put that in the show notes, folks. So if you're driving and uh, you know, we'll get you links to, to Dan's book and what, you know, the title of it and to the, this YouTube channel that uh, he and Elizabeth Cope put together with Myron. Because if you haven't experienced Myron Cope talking, hey, you're in for a real treat. <laughs> So I'm sorry, please there, continue. There's nothing. There is no other voice like it. People used to compare him, strangely enough, to Howard Cosell, which was true in the sense that they were both kind of uh, opinionated broadcasters with large vocabularies, SAT level vocabularies. But uh, and they got along quite well. Myron wrote about uh, Howard during his uh, magazine writing days. Uh, but they didn't sound anything like, you know, Cosell was a deep voice. Myron was a higher voice. There, there really is nobody else like him. But, but I, I think, I think we're people, cause I, I always said that too. And I am, and I'm a little bit older than you. So I grew up on the Howard Cosells and the Myron Copes and, you know, Beanie Cook, you know, being Pittsburgh guy, you know, but they all, but okay. Howard yeah. and Howard and, um, Myron both sort of had their own cadence that was different than the normal 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 tempatic yeah. speech of a, a person in normal conversation. And I I think some of it was some showmanship and some of their identity of their on air personalities to do it. But they were both so like you said so super intellectual that sometimes they they spoke above you. You know, Cosell definitely spoke above his audience, and yes. you know I, I can remember you know Frank Gifford and. Uh, you know, dandy Don in the Monday night booths, you know, look at each other and say, Howard, what the hell did you just say? You know, basically it's, and my room was now, sort of now, like that too. Yeah. But we have on the, on the YouTube channel, we have a couple encounters of Myron and Howard, uh, you know, either talking, one is on talking on his talk show and one is at a speech where Myron is introducing Howard and they're kind of going at each other, but but not in the way, you know, say two football players would. I mean, they, they, the vocabulary level is way higher than what, but, but it's still funny. You, you know, you can still follow it and, and, and really enjoy it. They're, they're just trying to outdo each other. Um, they, they, they liked each other a lot. I guess they had a lot in common. Yeah, I, I guess so. I guess something, you know, you, you really pulled out some surprises because like I was getting to earlier. I knew Myron as a broadcaster of the Steelers, a voice of the Steelers, the, the color man on Steelers radio. And that's really what I thought he, he was. Now you go into his background and you just connected me to this man a lot more in his early life, long before you and I were alive. But uh, you, know, you, you brought some special connections. First of all, you know, that he was a journalist first, which I, I did not know that. I knew he had a talk show and a radio show and a TV show. We could get some, when cable came out, we would get some things like the old KBL channel. And, you know, that's where I got introduced uh -huh. to Stan Saverin and, and things like that. But you get a little bit of Myron here and there if they had some Steeler specials on. And sometimes driving through, you know, driving south of here we get some pittsburgh stations and you can listen to wtae and you you get you know myron on there on his regular show but you you brought out the journalism and he really wrote for some some big time magazines besides the newspapers in town so why don't you tell us a little bit about that side of myron yeah myron went after he graduated he, myron was one of those people he always knew what he wanted to do he wanted to be a sports writer or a newspaper guy. He he grew up thinking he would be a newspaper guy. Uh, that was what sports writers did up until the 1950s for the most part. You, you, they wrote for newspapers. Um, and so he started out uh, writing for the school newspaper at Pitt, the University of Pittsburgh. And after he graduated, he went, he was looking for a job and he went to Erie, Pennsylvania. 
um, he got a job at the Erie Times. And, and one of the things I wanted to do with this book was highlight that early part of his career, the writing part of his career. Um, I found some articles he wrote for the Erie Times. Uh, they were pretty entertaining. It showed even at age 22, he, he had his trademark uh, humor. Um, and then after only seven months in Erie, he got he, the Post Gazette, the Pittsburgh Post Gazette offered him a job. He got on a bus at like 3 a.m. to come back to Pittsburgh. And uh, he stay, stayed with the Post Gazette for the next eight years, kind of being sort of an all purpose guy for them, covering whatever needed covered. He did a lot of pit uh, coverage, a lot of Duquesne University stuff. Um, and then he went off as a freelance writer for the magazines. This was the heyday of magazines in America, these publications that had three, four, five million readers. Uh, and you could make a good living. It was hard. You know, it was hard to make a living to break into that market. The competition was fierce, but Myron was really good. And from about age 30 or a little bit before, he started writing regularly, earning big checks. And he, he left the Post-Gazette to be a full-time freelance writer, which was, you know, an unusual thing uh, at the time. Um, and he covered, he, he covered the superstars like, uh, Muhammad Ali and, uh, Jim Brown. He actually wrote Jim Brown's autobiography. He was like the ghostwriter for the autobiography, which is interesting. You have, you have the face of the Browns. Yeah. You have the, the voice of the Steelers writing about the face of the Browns, although Myron was not yet the voice of the Steelers. So it's not quite as weird as it, you know, might be. Um, so he was writing about superstars, and then he wrote about what he called the nuts of the sports world, people who were their proudly their oddball selves, even as even as they were uh locked into this sports world where all that mattered was competition and being macho. Um, he was really and he won uh when he was like 33, he won a national sports writing award for his profile of Muhammad Ali. He was very much one of the elite sports writers in the nation. Yeah, well, you talk a little bit about Muhammad Ali in the book. And back before he was Muhammad Ali, when he was Cassius Clay. And yeah, he was, he was starting... Cassius Clay, yes. Right. Yeah. And uh, you, you had a very interesting encounter where they, they spent a little bit of time together, which I got a, a good chuckle of. And I'm sure the readers are, I don't know if you want to would be willing to talk about that experience. I, yeah, I mean, Myron, uh, Clay was not yet the champion. And so Myron was assigned to write about him and Clay's trainer, Angelo Dundee, uh, let's see, Clay was going to fight in Louisville, Kentucky, which was his hometown. They were in Miami uh, and Clay slash Ali didn't like to fly. So he was going to take a train and his trainer, Angelo Dundee, did not want to go on the train ride with Clay so he kind of uh, recruited Myron to sort of like, you know, be the chaperone slash babysitter, just make sure Clay got where he needed to go. And it was just an adventure because Myron said wherever he went on the train, you know, Clay was, this was the stage where Clay was like, I am going to be the champion <laughs> and uh, would talk about, he, he called uh, Myron, he named him Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney being the very famous, uh, very short actor. My Myron himself was only five foot four. And uh, he would say, I'm going to be the champ, Mickey Rooney. And it, 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 it bother him day and night about this and wouldn't let him sleep at night because he was writing poems. And then he would uh, show the poem to Myron. It, it, it was, as Myron said, it was great. It, it, was, it was horrible to go through in a way, but it was great material for a writer. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, you had one thing where Myron's trying to catch some sleep on the train and you describe uh, Clay's uh, bunk and curtain being right across the aisle from it. And all through the night, uh, you know, Cassius Clay's opening up Myron's curtain and say, hey, you know, Myron or Mickey Rooney, what do you think about this? And I can, yeah. I can just picture the voice. And I, I, that's, I guess that's maybe some of the comparison again to Howard Cosell because you knew how Muhammad Ali always sort of sparred and jabbed and the relationship yeah. he had with Howard Cosell on and I can picture that with Myron and I can hear Myron's reaction being similar to Cosell's being straight man to to all these you know jabs of you know wording jabs of uh fun you know uh, uh, Ali knew a good sports writer I think 
when he saw one. And he he knew the guys who were kind of funny and fun loving like him, and and he just you know established a good rapport. Yeah, uh, uh, definitely entertaining. I, I was glad that you had that in a book and something I, I learned about Myron as well, you know, as well as all the great journalistic feats that he had and, you know, ended up, uh, you know, being a, a freelance writer, which is no small deed, you know, back in that day, a very competitive field then and uh, was successful at it and, you know, fed, fed his family and uh, maybe he wasn't married yet, but he, he uh, made a, made a good living for himself anyway. So that was, that was interesting. So I guess uh, some of the other things, um, you know, is he eventually becomes uh, the, the voice of the Steelers and maybe just give us, you know, the, the, the nickel tour on that, how, uh, how he got the job of being with the Steelers. Myron had, he had been hanging out in the Steelers offices for years since the early fifties. He was, he was one of the first guys to really follow the draft and he would, he would hang out at the Steelers offices on draft day and see who they picked. So he was very familiar. Um, and in 1970, the Steelers were going a top to, undergoing a top-to-bottom transformation. They were moving to a new stadium. They were switching conferences. And among other things, they were getting rid of one of their old announcers. They wanted a, a color commentator. And somebody, on uh, Joe Gordon, who was their publicist, suggested that, hey, why don't we try Myron? Um, Myron had never called a football game before, but he agreed to learn on the job. And within about two years, Steeler fans had really embraced him in a way that, you know, they had never embraced any of the announcers before. And, and you know, the, and this was the time the Steelers were taking off. Uh, the dynasty was being built. And in 72, that was the year Franco Harris joined the team. And suddenly they had Franco's Italian army. And they had a, a fan club for the kicker, Roy Jurella. They were named Jurella's Gorillas. Mm -hmm. And these fan clubs, you know, this, there's no social media. If they want to, if you want to promote and, and yourself. And you this, is at, this is at the time when the Steelers were just moving into, and the Pirates into Three River Stadium too. So they had a new venue, a new voice and new players. So new coach and, and Noel yeah. was only there a couple of years. Oh yeah, yeah, right. And the, and the new coach yeah. and Chuck Noel. It was, it was complete transformation. So the fans, there's no social media. If they want to get publicity for their activities, they had to go through an announcer and they started going to Myron Cope. They they would send him, you know, like hot dogs at halftime and Myron would appreciate that and mention them on the air. And then he start, he came up with this idea with Jarellos Gorillas of having them make signs to psych out the opposing kickers. And this <laughs> caught on quickly and, and fans love that and then um with franco's italian army they 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 recruited him they named him a one-star general despite his lack of italian ancestry and then when he recruited frank sinatra into the army he got promoted to a two-star general you, you know it, it became uh he he connected with the fans like no other announcer ever had yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the Sinatra story because that was another one that gave me a good chuckle. It was a story that uh, I had heard before, you know, Frank Sinatra was part of the Italian army, but I really didn't know the full story. And you go into some good detail on it, uh, you know, on a, a road trip where they're you know, spending a little bit of time out west. And it's, I, I just really enjoyed the story of that. That was a great part of the book. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough. Uh, Elizabeth Cope had a, uh, a tape of her dad giving a like one of his after dinner speeches and he he went through that whole uh story in great detail and so we were lucky enough you know i, I, I put that in the book because it, it's it, it's funny and and insightful into how myron operated and and he had charisma i mean like how many people could just approach frank sinatra randomly he he, he had charisma and he had guts how many people could approach sinatra and say hey our football team. What the hell? Why would Sinatra know what a, about? Why would he care about a football team's fan club? But he, uh, you know, approached him, brought, brought him into the, brought him into the Steelers practice, and then Myron had to run on the field to get Franco over to meet Sinatra. It, it, it was just, I mean, really, I, I can't think of any comparable story of anybody doing something yeah. like that. Uh, but just, I mean, 
that you're right. That's amazing. But the most amazing fact I'm sitting here thinking is how did those two gentlemen that started the Franco's Italian army talk cope when he's basically on vacation for six days, you know, he's covering the Steelers, but he's in Palm Springs as they're, they're practicing getting ready for a West coast game. And they tell him, Hey, your whole mission is Frank Sinatra lives in Palm Springs. You got to look him up. You got to find him. And he's going to his house and things like that, you know, trying to, figure out a way to to meet Frank Sinatra and he meets him sort of randomly. And uh, yeah. it's kind of interesting. I, I think, I think Myron just enjoyed the challenge. You know, it was, <laughs> it was something that nobody thought he could do. He he wanted to show his, his buddies around the Steeler organization. Hey, I can, I can recruit big time names into this, this cause of ours. But okay. You know, you know I, I'm sitting here thinking about this back, the backdrop, you know, of course, um, his first partner in the booth was uh, Jack Fleming, who's, you know, great, great announcer, be man before Bill Hargro Hillgrove. And uh, and as, as Pittsburgh fans, you know, we're we're really spoiled listening to our sports. You know, we I can remember Bob Prince with the Pirates, you know, Lanny for Terry with the Pirates was great, you know, great announcers. You know, Myron, Jack Fleming, Bill Hillgrove, you know, Tun Chilkin, and, you know, uh, Latang with the Penguins. You know, we've had these great personalities that have really made the, the sport and loving our team that much more fun. But Jack Fleming was sort of, and you describe him, you know, sort of straight laced and he's very professional and, you know, his way we're going to do it. And Myron also befriends Chuck Knoll, who we know how stoic Chuck Knoll was, you know, hey, at, when you score a touchdown, act like you've been there before kind of guy. And Myron's mm -hmm. pulling these sort of, you know, in quotes, shenanigans of, you know, going to try to get uh, Frank Sinatra, who has really nothing to do with football, like you say, to become part of Franco's Italian army, you know, for a rookie running back you know, who hasn't done much yet. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. I, it, Chuck Knoll really had no tolerance for shenanigans, except I think when Myron was, pulling them uh and they uh they became they have two people who completely opposite type of personalities but they wound up becoming pretty good friends uh in in the book i, I mentioned that chuck Noll would come over to myron's house in upper st Clair, you know south of pittsburgh and he was the he functioned as the handyman in the cope household because <laughs> myron was famously inept uh with handling any I, I, he, apparently he, he really couldn't handle any technology, anything invented after about 1930. He always used, for instance, a manual typewriter. He, ne he never warmed up to electric typewriters. Computers were like alien technology, not, not going to be used. The, the cope hands were not going to work a computer. Uh, but Chuck Knoll was very adept at anything mechanical or technical so he would come over and change the light bulbs he would come over <laughs> and fix the dishwasher he was the gardener apparently in the cope uh front yard you know he planted the rose bushes or whatever because myron just couldn't do these kind of things it, 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 you, you think about it this is a four-time super bowl winning head coach and he's coming over to uh you know fix the stereo or whatever it, it's it's a it's a <laughs> crazy picture but this is what myron couldn't persuade people to do they 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 loved him they loved what he did and uh you know just i don't know i don't, I don't know what else to say about that yeah, yeah it, it was great great reading it was a great great story and you you know so many times throughout the story and throughout myron's career he did things that were just so I guess zany for lack of a better word that uh, just makes you laugh. And if you know who Myron is about and what he's about and how serious he is as an announcer, when he's, you know, when he's actually talking, he, he took his craft seriously, but he had fun with it. And that's what I think why somebody people were endeared to him, but uh, you had the stories of some of the commercials he made, I believe in the eighties of uh, you know, some of the, the zany, or maybe it was the late seventies. Uh, some of the zany things he, he did um, when the, I think it was the Macarena coming out and some of the other songs of the day if you could well, the, yeah, yeah that, that was actually um later um somewhere along the way his station manager decided it would be funny if myron sang i mean he had always done some singing you know for comedic effect on his talk show and then wta decided that that he was going to make videos and so he made one of a uh, mc hammer 
you can't touch this, but it was all about the Pirates making the playoffs in 1990. <laughs> and then he did one with the Achy Breaky Heart and the Steelers, and then he did one with the Macarena and the Steelers. Uh, and these are classic videos, you know, really, really, you know, almost fall off your seat funny. Do you uh, have those on your channel, on the YouTube channel? Or the not, not yet. Um, okay. But we're probably we're going to have. I, I, I just haven't gotten around to, to putting them on yet. You, you can find them in very low quality online, but we actually have them on higher quality once, once we get them on there. Um. Yeah, he would do zany things. Probably we'll put some commercials on there too, because the, the he would write or help to write the commercials and. And they would kind of play off his image and he would, but, but they, I mean, they're funny on their own. He would do tongue twisters of various kinds. Um, I think one one of them that you, if I may add, you talk about, uh, it was a, I forget what restaurant it was, a, a chain restaurant where they were had a dollar 99 special for oh, yeah. a sandwich. Subway. <laughs> Subway. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe tell you that one. That was, that was an on air during a game commercial. I take it. Right. It, it was a uh, promotion. It was something like if, if the Steelers scored a touchdown, you could go to Subway and get, you know, a meatball sandwich for a dollar ninety nine. And and Myron said, you know, uh, if the Steelers score, you get you get the Subway sandwich for a dollar for a buck ninety nine. Yeah, they're they're on me, but you got to pay a buck ninety nine. Right. And uh, <laughs> I mean, he would do stuff like that all the time in, in the games. He would often make Bill Hillgrove and Tunch Ilkin just break out laughing during the games and but, but you know they 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 were so used to it they they never missed a beat with the action uh it, it's not like the um fans were left in the dark about what was happening during the game they they just kind of smoothly went along and just kind of kind of incorporated Myron Zanius into the broadcast yeah you know, you you talk i mean the commercials are definitely a funny part of it you don't mind me talk about one one more now we talk about him having fun with some people that like to have fun, you know, the Andy Russell's and the Rocky Blyers of the world. Mm -hmm. Now he had one, a, a couple commercials for a local amusement park with probably a guy wow. that's uh, terrifying to not only quarterbacks, but uh, to many people outside of football too. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. He did a commercial for Kennywood, uh, the amusement park uh, with Jack Lambert, Jack Lambert being of course the nine time pro bowl, linebacker for the Steelers um who now it, it, the commercial is funny My, Myron was J Jack Lambert was six foot four and Myron was five foot four and the uh commercial has Lambert like literally picking Myron up and dragging him on to this water ride in at Kennywood and it was to promote the the new ride Raging Rapids this is in the mid 80s um, and this, the book tells the story of how the commercial was filmed. They had to go down the ride like 13 times and get really, really soaked to get the, uh, to get everything that the director needed. Um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to tell everything that, that's in the book, but that, that, that was one of the funny moments. We have a funny picture of it, uh, in the book, um, that, that was pre that was pretty much I think you you said for the commercials and that the uh, but they, just okay. entertaining. I just wanted to bring up that point, you know, that he had fun doing it. Even had you know fun with a guy like Jack Lambert who yeah. wasn't known for having a lot of fun out, outside of things. So <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's a good thing. Now I, I have to sort of backdrop this. Okay, now, I've been reading your book for the the last week and a half, uh, pretty seriously. And last week. Uh, as my, my listeners know, I got the opportunity to be honored down in Franklin, Pennsylvania with some former Steelers and some Steelers media. And uh, John Kolb was there and we got time to, we had about an hour and a half in a green room to just listen to him tell stories. And uh, a guy named Bay Lawrence, who's from Franklin, played for the Atlanta Falcons, came in and uh, Bill uh, Priaco, you know, the oldest living Steeler was in there. So these guys just would tell us stories and just guys like me that were just, you know, fan, I was going fanboy, just listening to it. And mm -hmm. just the, the, but a lot of it was about the relationships that Cole would tell with the Steelers. They, they, and he said it many times, they loved each other. That team of the seventies loved each other. And, you know, even, even they love Lambert, you know, it is, Lambert was sort of that odd, odd duck, the, the odd brother in the family, but they loved him and he embraced them too. And, to, and I think, and that's sort of when Myron sort of 
started taking center stage and finding his stride as an announcer. You know, he's only a few years into it himself, but I, 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 you know, I just have to say, and I'm putting it all together as I'm reading your book. I'm in that part of your book. I'm in the seventies, listening to stories from, you know, John Kolb of the seventies about Brad rooming with Bradshaw and some of the zany things that Bradshaw would do when they're playing and just the fun that they would have. But it all connected together that Myron was definitely a part of that Steeler family and connected yes. you know, right till the end and still well, actually still is today, you know, in the Steeler nation. Yeah, Myron, yeah, he was very much a, a pal of the 70s players in a way that I think announcers aren't really allowed to be today. The announcers are, I think, are much more separate from teams today. Uh, Myron hung out with them and drank with them and ate with them. And I think Myron played a big role in publicizing how special these 70 Steelers were as people, as personalities. A lot of them would come on his talk show and you know the, the public would get a chance to talk to them and hear them. And again, long before social media, if, if the players wanted to connect with the public other than, you know, they could go to dinner, dinners and things like that, but really they had to do it through uh, radio shows uh, or TV shows. And Myron's was by far the most popular in Pittsburgh. So they would go on his show and he would uh, he had a way of highlighting their personalities like Lambert. He was the one who nicknamed him Jack Splat. Uh, he used to make uh, not fun of. He would highlight Elsie Greenwood's gold shoes, which were an unusual thing in the NFL in the 1970s. Um, and and how, how many times in the 70s when. LC's wearing those shoes. Did you think uh, flags on the ground, you know, turn to play oh, oh, <laughs> right. defense of holding or something. Oh no, it's the shoes. <laughs> he, he, you know, so, so some of the commentaries, which we have on the YouTube channel, like he, he has one about Franco Harris. Now it really doesn't have anything to do with football. It has to do with Franco eating. Franco was apparently a legendary eater and he would go, the, the, the commentary is about him going to the Meadows horse racing track and just in, in, between making personal appearances, just gobbling up mashed potatoes and steak and shrimp and lamb chops and whatever they were throwing at him. It's it's really, really funny. Uh, there's another one where he's highlighting John Banizak being a former Marine uh, for Veterans Day. But of course, Myron, it, it, it's not a stirring patriotic call. My, Myron's just having a blast. You know, he's playing the Marine, him in the background and um, some of the other ones. Uh but, well, if, you, if, if we could just st stop on, because Banizak, you made me remember part of the book with Banizak, and it's uh, Super Bowl, I think, 13, where Steelers played the Cowboys. And, you know, of course, one of Myron's uh, creations that uh, he's famous for is the Terrible Towel, which I'm sure you, you want to get into here a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, the, the Terrible Towel really had its, its rise in the 70s. And maybe just talk a little bit about that and maybe talk about how it was in that Super Bowl and his conversation with Banizak after the game. Yeah, yeah. So Myron created, as probably many of your viewers here know, he, he created the Terrible Towel in 1975 uh, at his station's urging. They wanted a gimmick to get fans involved before a playoff game against Baltimore. And it caught on very quickly. Uh, and three years later, he began promoting it even more because th they began selling the Terrible Towel in Pittsburgh. So... Uh, he convinced, before Super Bowl XIII, he convinced Mike Webster, the center, to wear the towel during the game. And so he did. And and the Steelers were winning 35-17 in the fourth quarter. And Webster was on the sidelines. And he gave the towel back to Myron and said, hey, I'm not going to need this anymore. Because everyone kind of thought the game was over. So Myron put it in his briefcase and went off to, to get ready to do his locker room show. show. And then, of course, the minute the towel wasn't on the field anymore, the Cowboys began coming back. And I remember as an eight-year-old kid just watching the Cowboys, you know, they score the touchdown, they get the ball back on the onside kick, and then they score another touchdown. And I'm watching this game. I was like, are, is it, I, I, like everything's falling apart here. What? It's it's the first game all season the Steward, there, where, where there's some drama because the Steelers had just rolled over everybody all season. And the Steelers, of course, hung on and won the game. And Myron is talking to John Banizak after the game and he's admitting that you know this is uh, losing the lead there almost th th this was my fault because i 
I took away the towel. And Banizak <laughs> said, you know, Myron, you know, it, it is all your fault. How we we blame you, Myron Cope. It, it, it's it's a very funny interview, but it it just goes to show how much the towel caught on so quickly. Because I mean, I don't think NFL players are even allowed to wear uh, team paraphernalia during a game now you know yeah. it, it would be it was only a few years after that when uh who's the quarterback jim mcmahon of the the bears had his famous thing where he wore like the adidas uh headband and pete roselle made him take it off and so the next week he wore a white headband and just said roselle on it you know they, yeah they weren't <laughs> allowed to advertise non-sponsors of the nfl and you know yeah terrible town i'm sure probably yeah, but... was not in that class <laughs> Yeah, no, the the, the, my, the Steelers loved the towel. Not Lynn Swan we used to run out on the field uh, waving it, and uh, it caught on. But now, see, one of the great things about the book is I was able to go into Myron's papers and really get kind of the behind the scenes story of the towel, uh, the the original contracts, the legal battles. And people don't realize this. Uh, after the towel became such a big hit, other establishments in Pittsburgh began violating the trademark. And began selling their own terrible towels. And so Myron unleashed the lawyers on all these like toy stores and car dealers and, and bakeries that were using unauthorized terrible towel products. Uh, so that, that's one thing I go into in the story in the book. And another thing is that when the Steelers, you know, they won the two Super Bowls, 78, 79, and then they crashed the third place in 1980. And the towel. Just, I mean, it was the, the bottom that fell out. It suddenly they couldn't sell them anymore. And the department store that was selling them, Gimbals, uh, they sent Myron a letter saying, you know, previously he'd been getting all these big, big royalty checks. And then they sent him a letter saying, when you're, we will send you another check when your royalties reach the sum of $10. That's how much the towel stopped selling when, uh, when the Steelers stopped winning Super Bowls. And it, it kind of stayed dormant like a dormant volcano almost until the mid 90s when the bill cower era began and suddenly the Steelers became a super bowl contending team again and then it never left for some reason that time it caught on permanently uh, and my myron was very proud of that that it's he he said i think now this has become a permanent part of the steeler nation of the steeler culture and, and he was correct you know, and I was kind of surprised by that when you sort of talked about that lapse of, you know, the early 80s until the 90s teams, you know, with the, the Cower era coming of the terrible town not selling. Because, gosh, in, in our house, you know, we still had our terrible towels from the, the 70s and 80s and, you know, and, and, you know, up here in Erie, Pennsylvania, terrible towel was still very much apparent. And actually, you connected to me again. You made a reference of my hometown is Edinburgh, and my parents still live right uh, wow. next to Sox Harrison Stadium, Edinburgh University. I graduated from Edinburgh University, and they have a they have a connection to the terrible town. Maybe you could share that. I do know that connection. Now, I, I only alluded to this in the book, but um, I think in 79, students at Edinburgh University created what was then the world's largest terrible towel, something like 50 feet long by 30 feet wide. And then it was displayed. Is that right? Not, no, no. You would describe it in a book, which and I think you're you're right too. In the book, ninety three. Would you say ninety three yards by fifty? It was almost the football field. I, can... well, I, I, think there, I think there was a later one which covered the football field. I think this one, the, the first one at least, was enormous in its own right. Maybe didn't cover the whole football field, but and they displayed it at the uh, the dolphin, the Steelers Dolphins playoff game that year, and. I, I really didn't have time to enough space to go into this in the book, but I found a description online about how this towel was created. It was a massive, like two month project by the students there. And I, I was actually asking Elizabeth Cope, whatever happened to that towel? And I, I, I was going to maybe... ask you that. No, I, I, I was just talking to somebody not too long ago when I was reading the book. Actually, my, my father came home from work one day and I was in the house and we lived right across the road from it. He goes, he goes, God, there's something big and yellow down on campus. Because by the football field, there's giant open fields, like where they play soccer games, and they're, they're putting buildings there now. But And I can't remember. Maybe it was even in the football stadium. I don't remember. He said, you, there's something going on there. So I got on my bike, and I rode over there to see what the heck is going on. And I'm seeing, oh my God, it's a terrible towel. you know. And, and then you know, a couple months later, whatever, we see it on TV. I'm like, wow, that's, that's the one we saw. And it's, 
And it was oh, actually, is at that time, it was Edinburgh State College at that time. It wasn't even Edinburgh University yet. It was Edinburgh University right before I attended there in the later yeah, 80s. I, I actually, when, I was, I, when I went to the Steelers home, home opener, I toured the Steelers Hall of Honor, and I asked our tour guide what ever happened to that original ginormous, terrible towel. But nobody seems to know. It, it must exist out there. It's, it's probably... or remnants of it or something i i know i don't know of anywhere on edinburgh's campus or even a part of it i'm not aware of it unless it's like in the dean's office or something i, I don't know but <laughs> in places i wasn't allowed to go as a student but maybe it's in a box like in the in a basement in erie somewhere you know maybe you know it's just waiting to be uh discovered again i don't know uh, Elizabeth, well, i'm gonna make i'm gonna make, I'm gonna make that my now. mission this week I'm going to contact <laughs> some folks I know at the university and tell them we want to know as the public wants to know what happened to this giant, terrible towel. And maybe we can get some answers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know. We'll, we'll, we'll keep the, the verdict out on that, but uh, yeah, yeah I, you, you know, we'll, well, uh, we'll, we'll announce, if you, if you do find it, we'll announce it on the Myron Cope channel on the, on the, on the YouTube channel okay. because th that would be news. I think. Yeah, absolutely. That's you know, that's an undertaking. You know, I don't I don't even remember even seeing I've seen giant American flags, but I don't think I've ever seen one as large as that. Uh when you when you have I mean it probably took a couple hundred people to hold this thing. <laughs> it was, I mean, like they held it like a, it. they held it almost like you did a a parachute like in gym class when you were a kid, you know. You Yeah. It, it, there's a story out there somewhere online about you know how they assembled this and it, it's like they made it in giant strips and then sewed it together. I think mm -hmm. uh, that today, sounds right. Today you could probably do, do it like a three D printing, you know, uh, of it. Uh, I don't know. Back then it was it was all manual and but it, you know, but so, but what what other fan base in any era would have? You know, first of all, nobody has a terrible towel to do. You know, there's people that have tried to to fake it. You know, I have you know. In Erie, we're, we're in the Buffalo market. So I have a lot of friends that are Buffalo Bills fans. A lot of people up in Buffalo that are historians that I talk to. And they had like their, some uh, weenie thing, you know, that they banged together two balloons, you know. No, it wasn't the green weenie that you talk about, but they had yeah, something yeah. in the 80s or something that they, thunder sticks or something that they thought were something great. And I said, you know, Miami had their white towels that never really caught on. I said, but nobody has mm -hmm. a terrible towel that, when you say the word terrible towel, everybody knows it's associated to Steelers. I don't know of any yeah. other thing in any sports where you have something that iconic that associates with the team. And Myron did that. Yeah. Although, I, can I put in a word here about Buffalo fans? Sure. Now, I live in what could be called a mixed neighborhood. We have uh, Steelers fans, Ravens fans, Redskins, Bills, Chiefs, kind of everything. And you have a lot of people in my neighborhood who have inflatable mascots on their yard, in, in their front yard. And there's one family near me. Okay, they they started out with like an inflatable buffalo, uh, like a standard Bills red red and blue buffalo. And then one day a baby appeared. It was a little baby uh, buffalo. <laughs> and then next it was a Halloween themed buffalo. It's like a skeleton, but buffalo with a black skin skeleton, and then it has a pumpkin for a head. And then <laughs> next you had an American buffalo with like the red, white, and blue, the flag buffalo. And then there was an Irish buffalo with like shamrocks on it. And there's this herd, <laughs> you know, in, in this neighbor's yard. Um, so I, I have to say, I admire this. This this is dedication. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. Uh, that, is, that is a terrible towel level of devotion, I think. Um, but yeah, in general, I talk about in the book, about how Miami had white hankies. What they had was hankies. And you mm -hmm. see video of it, and it just looks kind of wimpy. Uh, Oakland had black socks for a little while, which, again, it's vaguely more threatening than a white hanky, but it's not terribly inspiring either. And the Pirates, they had the green weenie, which I never understood. And then they had something called the Bushka Power, which was you know like the head wrapping you know that women wear. Not again. It was interesting, not not real well, but, inspiring. But pi pirates, you know, of the Caribbean wore the the scarfs on their head, you know. So I guess you could get almost like a babushka style, and some of them. Yeah, yeah. And they it, don't have the big, was, uh, you know, Captain Black uh, or Captain Hook hats, you know. But the the regular guys, they had the they just wore a bandana on their head. 
Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Babushka thing for the Pirates, this, this was a Bob Prince idea in the 70s, and it kind of caught on for one summer, but it didn't last. But actually, uh, I mentioned in the book, Bob Prince, he he looked at the terrible towel as a bit of a ripoff uh, from, uh, from what he called Mother Babushka. But I, I don't think Myron really was trying to copy anybody. My, Myron was really, it, it was an original idea that grew out of a meeting at WTAE and he he just ran with it, you know, and, and, and no, people have tried to copy him. You know, he wasn't copying anybody. People were just copying him. Yeah. I, I thought, you know, it was astounding. I, I knew the terrible towel was popular, but when you share some of the revenue numbers that were Myron's cut and it, it was just a percentage of the sale. And I mean, my goodness in the seventies, He's making more than some people that are making good money, you know, doing a full time job. He's just making off of the terrible towel sales. He hit one one month, one month, his royalty figure was equal to like the minimum salary for major league baseball players at that time. It, it was that popular. And then later on in the nineties, he was just, I mean, he he was making what like uh, NFL players were, but for briefly, only for a couple years. And then he, I think he had decided he had got his cut and he devoted all the royalties to uh, the Allegheny Valley School for people with disabilities. I, I mean, what kind of generosity is that? It, 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 we talk well, about this in the book. Elizabeth talks about that in the book. I mean, she has mixed feelings about it. What yeah, he did there. I, I, I wanted to talk about that. She she's got some sentiment uh, about that, which you know I think if any of us were probably in her shoes, you know, he, her, basically her dad said, "Hey, you know, you're not getting a towel." You know, when he was healthy, he said that you're not going to get really any of the revenue of the towel. And it's, I mean, folks, we're talking, you know, six figures he's making off this towel in the the '90s on, on a couple occasions. I think you you said so. If he, you bank that and you have it in the bank right now and you're making five to 10%, you invest in a stock market, you're making 10% a year on it. You, you got a pretty good, healthy uh, way to live just off the, the dividends from that. <laughs> so, it's, uh, yeah. so, so it's definitely not a chunk of change. But there's a reason why Myron donated it to the autism uh, place. So maybe you could share that with what why that reasoning was. Yeah, his, his son, uh, Danny, was born with some kind of brain damage. Um, and early on, his mother noticed that he react, he reacted violently to loud sounds. And then he would hit people randomly as a, as a child. Uh, and he was diagnosed eventually with autism, which was, which I believe in the 1970s was kind of a new diagnosis, a new explanation. I think people before then, kids who had this were kind of, they were, I hate to say this, they were put in institutions and sometimes forgotten. Myron really, really didn't want this to happen to his kid. And so he joined the Autism Society of Pittsburgh and they he began to raise money for research into this. And even early on in the 70s, he was giving a big chunk of his royalties from the Tao to this cause. Um, Danny to this day lives at the Allegheny Valley School. Uh, he's still he's fifty six years old. He has never spoken, and um, Myron wanted to make sure that this school had a steady stream of revenue, uh, so his son would always have a safe place to live, and uh, it, it's worked out. I mean, it's not, it's not the only source of revenue for the school. They get I think they get money from the state. But it helps, you know, maintain the facilities there. And they, they still, they make, I think, tens of thousands when the Steelers are just doing okay. And when they make the Super Bowl or the AFC Championship, the royalties spike and they make uh, hundreds of thousands. Uh, so, you know, Myron's, th th this is Myron's legacy. Now, near the end of the book, you paint and if you don't mind me speaking of it you sort of paint um it's a great closure to to it and the scene is myron has has passed on and he's being celebrated by the steelers being put in the the ring of honor at uh, uh, Stadium or maybe it was Heinz Field at that time and 
He uh, it so, should be Heinz uh, Field. That, yeah, that's it should my be. Opinion. I, I, I can't. Yeah, it's, I still want to call it Three Rivers sometimes. So I'm, I'm <laughs> way too old school. But anyway, uh, Elizabeth is going to accept the honor from the Steelers on behalf of her father, and it's at a game, and she gets her uh, gets some relatives, including her brother Danny, and they are going out for the ceremony, and da- they give Danny a terrible towel, and uh, you know you sort of paint the scene and I can, though I didn't witness it or saw a video of it, maybe I did and I just don't remember, but I can just picture th- this man coming out of the tunnel and maybe not fully aware of everything that's going on, but probably somewhere deep inside him, he knows that this towel is a connection to his father. And it's just so, it, it just brought a sense of uh, emotions, uh, you know, going to the reader. And I thought that was really special and very what eloquently said the way that you and Elizabeth told that story. And I, I really appreciated that. Th- th- thank you. I mean, but that, now that, that chapter, that is Elizabeth writing that that's not even her telling it to me. She, yeah, that's all she wrote, the, when you have Elizabeth talking, it's all italics, which is very nice to to know who's uh, speaking and telling a story. So yeah, but it was, it was awesome. I, I loved the, especially for being near the end of the book and that closing up, uh, you know, which is a story you've been uh, I'll, telling. T- I'll tell her that she, she'll appreciate hearing that because um, she worked very hard to kind of you know, transmit the emotion of that moment and other moments in her life. And in her closing speech at the dinner party the night before, and I'm not going to, we'll let the readers do that because it's really can't do justice. You and I talking about it, but in her own words in in print is just, uh, you know, it's, it's really immaculate uh, to do things. And And speaking of immaculate, we mm-hmm. have other things that uh, Myron is famous for. He was a wordsmith, like you said. He named Jack Lambert, Jack Splat. And yeah. why don't you talk about some of the other things, the, the ones that lasted and we enjoy today and know, and maybe some, there, you have one uh, or two that uh, didn't work out so well. It didn't quite catch on. Now he named, yeah, he named Jack Lambert, gave him his nickname. He named Cordell Stewart Slash. He named uh, Jerome Bettis the bus, although I think he, he borrowed that one. He heard that one from somebody else. He, of course, named the Terrible Tau. Um, and the Immaculate Reception, th- now that's an interesting story. He was not in the radio booth when that happened. He had gone down to get ready for his postgame show in the locker room, uh, but he had stopped by the sideline. Uh, and so when Franco made the catch, if you watch the film closely, you can see Myron. He zooms by Myron on the sideline. I, uh, Myron was like almost in position to make the tackle. That's how close he was. <laughs> he That night, he was getting ready for a commentary on the 11 o'clock news in Pittsburgh. And a fan called him up and said, you know, you should call this the Immaculate Reception. And Myron wasn't sure about it at first because he thought this could be sacrilegious, you know, to, and and this is December 23rd, two days before Christmas, you know, so it's very fitting. So people are thinking about the immaculate uh, conception at that point in time. So, yeah. And and this is, and and, and Myron is of Jewish descent. He's Mm -hmm. raised Jewish all his life. So very very interesting, that that whole thing too. So I'm sorry. He he didn't didn't want to uh, possibly upset anybody by making a religious reference. But, um, you know, one of the things, this is in the book, a lot of people, when they saw this play, immediately thought of it in terms of, wow, this is like from God. It was, it's so different than any other play in NFL history and so unlikely. If I could go on a little tangent here. Yeah, yeah, please, please do. Okay. I, I actually, I think about this, like a true Steeler fan, I think about this sometimes. And, you know, there, you see deflections of passes, you know, several times in any NFL season that, that go for touchdowns. You know, players will bat the ball around, it'll maybe pop up and somebody else will catch it and it'll go for a touchdown. That in itself is not that unusual. And of course, you have last minute touchdowns, even in playoff games. That's not a, that, all that unusual. But I think, and help me if I'm wrong here, I can't think of any other play in NFL history where the ball bounced backwards 25 feet and was caught. And and I can't think of any other play 
where the defense, you can visibly see the defense relax. Like, oh, we won. The ball was batted down. Tatum, Tatum broke up the pass. And, and all these things happen simultaneously. And then Franco catches it, makes this shoestring catch, which some people, you know, pour over the film, like, like the Zapruder film. And, you know, he, and he runs in for the touchdown. And then the refs talk for like five to 10 minutes, depending on who's telling the story. I, I mean, th there's such a series of circumstances that are really unlike anything else almost in sports. And then, of course, the Steelers get the get the touchdown. Um, and Art Rooney and Dan Rooney, you know, both of them said after the game that, you know, the, I mean, I, th I think Art Rooney's exact quote was, uh, the Lord might have had her, his hand on our shoulder. For that play, there was a, a quasi-religious aspect to it, uh, and so Myron, so this fan suggested to Myron call it the Immaculate Reception, and he thought about it for three minutes and said, "What the hell? I'll go with it." And he said it on the air, and it caught on pretty quickly. Um, and he, but he knew, you know, that that this was the right name, that that a generic name that incorporated the word miracle, you know, wasn't enough. For this play this was beyond miracle and i talk about in the book how this completely changed the course of pittsburgh sports history how suddenly the steelers were the top team in town and the, and the pirates were kind of buried almost some of this is my opinion i actually would like to hear what other people think of it um but um yeah myron he was a wordsmith i'm going let me go back to myron now he uh he was a wordsmith and he was really good at applying nicknames to people and describing people, you know, f during his sports writing career. The only real misfire he ever had when they were, was when they were trying to name the Steel Curtain. And his idea was, let's call them the Anvil Chorus, and which was like an image from an opera, like an 1850s opera. And he convinced the band at Three Rivers to play a theme from this opera whenever the Steelers sacked Jim Plunkett, who was then the uh, Patriots quarterback. And they played it like seven times because the Steelers kept sacking Plunkett, but the fans just like, well, they, what, what, the heck, what the heck is this? They they had no idea what this music was. So that one didn't catch on. But and, and did you have somebody, somebody describe it? I forget who it was. One of the media personalities at the time said, we couldn't figure out why the, the band kept playing funeral music every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was hilarious, but, but yeah. So, you know, yeah, that was, that was one of his misfires, but the others that you're saying, the slash, the bus being, uh, I, Jack in, in the nineties. Yeah. He, he wanted to call when the Steelers came back in the nineties, he wanted to call the defense, the steel trap, which I always thought that's a really good nickname. And just, I don't know, that one didn't catch on, but it, I, I, I think it should have. I, I think that was a good, that was a quality. Now that, and I don't know if Myron can take care of it, but that's what sort of when Blitzburg was in, in vogue, though. So, yeah. So that would have been hard to. Oh, Blitzburg was pretty good. Whoever did that, that was, was kind of genius, yes. too. I was right up there with the steel curtain and uh, you know some of the things that Myron came up with. But go, mm -hmm. going back to the Immaculate Reception, um, you want to hear other opinions. We did an episode. I have a, a good friend. It's a Raiders fan. He's wrote prior five or six books on the Raiders, uh, Rich Smelter. And back. Uh, it was probably the 48th anniversary of it. We did a tribute to the Immaculate Reception, a Raiders perspective who hate it and think everything was bad and illegal and everything. And my perspective. And we, I told Rich, I said, before, the week before, I said, watch the film on it. Let's, you know, let's dissect it. Let's put it in slow motion. Let's really tell what this was. And at the same time, I believe uh, Peyton Manning had his show out where he talked about the Immaculate Reception. It was on ESPN+. Plus. And he had Franco there and Frenchie Fuqua and Bradshaw and, you know, um, a couple of the Raiders that were, were part of it. And they all sort of said their opinions of it. So we had all this sort of to use this context. But we came out of it and I, I sort of had a different appreciation for it because I was young when it happened. I remember it happening. Be, I was over in the corner playing with toys or something and my, my dad and my grandfather <laughs> were going nuts and, hey, kid, well, come watch us. This is going to be history. But what it did it was, was it. Were, were you in the bright? Were you in the. 
TV broadcast area, or were you in the blackout area where you only heard the radio? We we were we were in the buff. We're always in the Buffalo market, so we had the game okay, on. So you yeah, it. so we we had to get the game on the you know, playoff game. We we got so people would travel up to Edinburgh to to watch games, just like they did Ohio, like you talk about. But anyway, yeah. so we have our you know our antenna tuning in the Erie Station to get it. But anyway, is that no other time can I think of in sports history where it ignited a fan base and jump started a dynasty that really had been somewhat dead for 40 years and turned it into, you know, especially to build the dynasty that would happen a couple of years later. That really was the, the the ground zero of the Steelers dynasty was the immaculate reception people, you know, more than just you and I can do the experts of history can sit there and say, that's when the Steelers became a team that the contender. And, yeah. and it, it, then you talk about, all the mystery of it, the films that we have available, Franco, when he's catching it, you can only see the top part of the ball. You can't see Franco's feet. You can't see the the turf of Three River Stadium. So it it puts this a little bit of enigma and a mystery into it that, you know, it's like, you know, like you said, some of these famous films that are gone over by, you know, investigators, the JFK shooting and things like that. You know, it's right up there with those because this happened. Same thing with, did it hit Tatum first or did Fuqua touch it first? You know, and uh, you know, so you have, you have all this going on Bradshaw under duress in the backfield and just, you know, basically throwing out of, you know, so he doesn't get killed by uh, one of the, the Raiders fans or Raiders guys that are chasing him around back there, but so many elements in it. And then to be at the point in the game where it was, where the offensive Steelers had nothing going all day. And Kenny Stabler just had that, uh, you know, as, as a rookie, runs for that touchdown and puts the Raiders up seven to six, you know, what more can you say about it? The, the, all the drama, the mystery and it igniting the, the fan base and the Steelers. I, there's nothing else like it. It, it, it did. It, it is, it is the big bang of. Right. right yeah. Steelers. That's it. That's the word. That's the word. Yeah. It, it is the big bang. Um, my, when the, Myron's role in the dynasty and and just Steeler culture, Steeler nation in general, he amplified everything that was taking place. This, the fans would have become very attached to this team anyway. They won four Super Bowls, but Myron turbocharged it, you know, with with the towel and with his just his description of the action during the game and promoting the players. It became far more of a connection. He he really bonded, helped bond. I mean, the players were the, the main catalyst, but really he helped bond the city to the team in a way that probably wouldn't have happened as fast and may, maybe not have happened as solidly had he not been there. I don't think other dynasties quite have the same attachment. You know, the, the fans, it, I don't know, some, some cases, yes, some cases, no. But I mean... Okay, I'm going to back off. Forget, forget other dynasties, but um, he really just amplified, magnified, multiplied the connection between the fans and the team, uh, and it, it set off this explosion, which has not really died down to this day. Yeah, even in the the bad years, which were spoiled, Steelers fans were spoiled. The last uh, 50 years, you know, my, my entire life, you know, I, I've yeah. seen him win su six Super Bowls and, and lose a couple more. And I can't say that the the folks, the first 40 years of Steelers, they did, you know, they didn't even make a playoff game, really. <laughs> At that time, 47, they got close, but uh, really wasn't yeah. playoffs either. But so we're spoiled. And other, you know, I'm around people that are Cleveland fans and, they really had nothing, you know, for forever since Jim Brown and Paul Brown left the the Browns, and mm -hmm. uh, you know that's how spoiler the Bills fans that we talk about. Yeah, they gotten close a few times, but they never sealed the deal yeah. and had yeah. some really disappointing heartbreaks, which we have too. But we've also had some glorious moments to celebrate. Yeah, so. yeah, um, and Myron Myron cranked up the celebration. I think more yeah. than. Absolutely. He he endeared himself to the fans. And, and folks, when you go to uh, the Dan's YouTube channel and listen to some of the way Myron talks, yeah, there's there's some Yinzer uh, words put in there because that's where Myron's from. He's a Pittsburgh guy. 
but he also right. brought some of his, uh, I guess maybe some of his Jewish roots into it. Just like the title says, you know, behind the yoy, Myron would always say yoy and double yoy. And, you know, he had a lot of little colloquialisms that were only Myron could pull off. You know, no, you didn't hear right. Bill Hart Hillgrove ever say those words, but, uh, you, you know, I, I investigated this. Yoy is not a Yiddish word. Yoy no. is a Myron word. He created it. Uh, a lot of his words were just things that he just happened to say one day and thought they sounded good. Uh, it sounds maybe, maybe somebody else said that before. Uh, a lot of it was just his own lingo. He actually didn't speak like a stereotypical Pittsburgher did. He did not. Somebody wrote me one day from the YouTube channel asking, can you send me a clip of Myron saying yins or yinzer? And I said, I'm not aware that any exist because that was not, Myron didn't talk like that. He he had his own personal brand of uh, vocabulary of lingo, which that, that's what he- And, and he didn't uttered. say Mount, Mount Washington. I, I don't remember him ever putting the R's in Washington and war, you know, to take a look at your yeah. warch, you know, which are Pittsburgh- things you know we, we don't speak like yeah. that up here in here either but that's that's, 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 that's <laughs> pittsburgh, it's pittsburgh centric you know that's uh, definitely pittsburgh words he didn't say yinzer he didn't say gum band he didn't say red up you know he didn't say jag off you know any of these things that stereotypical pittsburgh words which you will see in like a pittsburghese dictionary none none of that or maybe just a teensy bit of that came out of his mouth he, he was original yeah but he was definitely so endeared to the fans and uh you know once again, Dan, let's uh, tell the title of your book and where folks can get this, because I think we've we've got the, even if you're not a Steelers fan, I think we got you a little bit excited because it's such a great story of a, a man that uh, had so such an illustrious history in sports. When you're talking to Cosell and Ali, Jim Brown's uh, biography, and you know then all the great th things with the Steelers and all the Steelers legends. So, so why, don't you, why don't you take that opportunity to tell us again the title and where people can get it. It's called Behind the Yoy. It was just published by University of Nebraska Press. You can get it from them, or you can buy it on Amazon, or at any fine Barnes and Noble dealer in the greater Pittsburgh area or beyond. Dan, we really appreciate that you and Elizabeth told Myron's story and talking about you know his whole career and all the great things he did, and uh, for coming on today and telling us uh, more about it. And thank you for that. You, you are very welcome. This was a lot of fun.